here, but they're... All right. You know, Are we ready? That means everyone has to sit and be silent and pay attention. This is, this is the rare panel, and this crowd expects, expects absolute attention. All right. We've agreed up here, the panel members, and the moderator, which is what I am, we've agreed that we go in this way. I would call on each panel member from uh, right to left, I guess, if you start off. And there will be five minutes limit. And I will enforce the five minutes. I will really enforce it. We'll cut off the mic. We want these panel members to give in five minutes out of their experience in the church and in the interaction with this issue. We want them to address the to topic, what can the church do? Think about that as they talk. What can I, my church, my faith, what can we do to confront this issue? Then after each has had their five minutes, and they all bring very rich experience and backgrounds, we're going to throw it open to you because I think you would like to have a chance to address this issue through what you can say to the uh, ask to this panel. Now, the rules about your questions are these. Questions only. No speeches. I will call you out of order if you try and make a speech. Don't tell me why you want to ask the question. Just ask the question. I can do this very... I'm a journalist, you see. I'm not involved like you know, a lot of folks. So I'm. I know how to do this kind of thing, so I will say no. Thank you, but move on. All right, let's start with Dick, and I will give you the microphone. Is that your, your live mic? Right? All right, five minutes. I'll time you. We're going to know. Dick told everybody knows who's up here, so take it from there. Thank you. Uh, Episcopal Church. I went to seminary in 1964, and as I mentioned, met in IMT. I was totally ignorant of the Palestinian issue, but never really knew there was one, and I heard his story. I didn't uh, pick it up again until 20 years later, when I took the group over from, my, uh, from the cathedral in Seattle in 1984. And what I discovered then was total ignorance, and I've been learning ever since um, about this concern. And so one of the things I found that our church has done, and that I've done, is to bring people over. Uh, I've taken four trips with uh, parishioners, and I will say the people that have come back from those trips have become very involved, most of them, over the uh, period. I've gone to Seville conferences. I've brought people to Seville conferences. I'm going to Seville conferences. I'm going next week, and I'm taking, I'm taking three people uh, with me. Uh, my learning of, of taking people over comes from uh, about 16 or 17 trips that I've gone over. Uh, like I said, with, with church groups and, uh, and myself with sabbatical and learnings at St. George's uh, Art College there in East Jerusalem. What I discovered in the political uh, environment um, and the way in which the church has failed, as far as I can see on this issue, failed not only the Palestinians, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Israelis, is being silent. We have been silent. And I learned this when I uh, sponsored in 1991, I was a, a deputy to my convention, the Episcopal Convention, uh, and uh, presented a resolution on a two-state solution, and it's still a part of our official church policy. Uh, it came into that convention, and it was very, very controversial. Why? Because we were told by a number of people that visited our convention from the uh, that were Israeli Jews, that we would damage our relations with Israel if we passed this, to state solution. And it was something we should not pass, we shouldn't even talk about it. I, I learned that at that time, because it to me was a, was a part of what the solution needed to be. And that was uh, 15 years ago. And now, let's see what Jeff was saying about the two-state solution. Uh, we were somewhat silenced. Uh, 
and at least that seems to be the case that uh, has happened in my experience at the church. I also have found that uh, Seville came out with his statement a year and a half ago on moral responsibility in investments. And that has caused a furor around the church, as the Presbyterians here might uh, speak to. And uh, there's been all kinds of, uh, of, I think, distortion on that issue. Very simply, Sabila said, if anyone's making money off the occupation, uh, we need to, as a church, say that that's a no-no. That we don't help them make money off of the occupation. We're not saying, uh, take your money out of Israel, or uh, anti-Israel, or whatever. The occupation is what we are targeting. And I think the church needs to do that. So I would say that my learning is that we need to break the silence and take some stands here that we know will help both the Israeli uh, Jew and uh, the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you very much. You set a good example with your five minutes. I appreciate that. Tom, our host pastor has already shown you what a church can do. It can bring 350 people. to a two-day two conference and really generate a lot of energy and enthusiasm. Now, uh, Tom, do you want to stand on your laurels or do you want to use five minutes to make more suggestions of what we can do? I never pass up the opportunity for five minutes. Um, one of the things that seems to me that is, is happening is, is the prophetic voice in the church has has changed um, in how it can be effective. Um, I understand, I'm, I'm not old enough to know that this is true, but I understand that there was a time when the mainline church denominations could make statements and could take positions and people in the pew wanted to hear that, wanted to dialogue with that, not only in the pew, but even people in the community uh, were, were concerned about, uh, about what the faith communities were saying about about what was good and moral and just in the society. Um, that is no longer an effective mode of the mainline church to take stance. What people in the pews do with that largely now is, is they'll hear that and often not even understand it, as, as Dick has pointed out, and just and use it as a measuring stick of whether they agree with those folks or not. Um, it is not a conversation that influences and informs the moral conscience of, of people in, in the congregations. It doesn't mean that people in the congregations are not interested in the conversation about what is moral and right and just, but I think the format is a, is a 1950s, perhaps, format that, that at least we as Presbyterians are still trying to hold on to in the present day and are painfully aware uh, that it is no longer effective have not found out what to do otherwise. I'm suggesting that we have conversation. I think that, that prophetic voices are heard when relationship is involved. Um, not exclusively, but because sometimes we hear prophetic voices and there is no relationship, but I think the church provides, faith communities provide an opportunity for prophetic voice in relationship because when there are those that I love who will, will push and pull and try to uh, present a new way, I listen to that differently than I listen to statements and positions of the church, whatever that is. That's why I think conversation is, is not an insignificant thing. Here's one illustration of why I, I, I think it's been shown. Do I have two minutes? A few weeks ago, we saw a tragedy in the Amish community. And that very day, or the next day, we watched a group of Amish that walked to the house of the family of the gentleman who had killed the children in the Amish community, and they communicated forgiveness. If that had happened, I suspect in any of our communities, the reaction would be, we are presumptuous to speak the language of faith on behalf of the community, it is not our place. One of the reasons I think the Amish could do that, now there are a lot of reasons, some of which are very troubling, it's a patriot, well, it's some, some troubling, but one of the reasons that is healthy 
is they do talk. They do have conversation about their faith. So it was not a foreign idea. It was not something that they needed to convince themselves that forgiveness is the response when heartbreak and injury comes. And, and I, I think the mainline church needs to recover, recover that faith conversation that it might hold on to prophetic voice. Fine, thank you. <laughs> Sandra Oldwine is a Methodist, United Methodist pastor. She's just back from nine and a half years as our missionary, and I'm also a United Methodist, in Bethlehem and all over Palestine, Israel. So from that experience, let us hear your five minutes, Sandra. Well, first I suppose I'd say ditto to what uh, has been said coming down the table. And I was actually going to focus on the importance of the visitation. Uh, all the things that you're hearing here today come to life in a new way when you come and are able to come to the land uh, and get off the bus, um, especially on, if you're on a pilgrimage bus that runs where Jesus walked, um, where you rush from holy site to holy site and treat the peoples of the land as a background to your religious experience. Um, it's not a helpful way to come in contact with the people. So that, that one of the most important things I think that the churches are beginning to do, and part of all of our denominations have representatives on the ground now to enable and to empower, to equip visitors to get off the tour bus, to get down off the streets, into the alleys, into the refugee camps, and meet with Palestinians and Israelis across the religious, the political, the social spectrums to break out of the uh, stereotypes that we may have of both peoples, uh, and, and of the three faiths that live in that country, uh, and to hear their dreams, their, the realities of their life, the challenges they face, uh, so that their stories become entwined with our stories. And I want to bring that then back, uh, because once you meet people there, and once you've sat and sit hot tea with someone in their shop or in their home, uh, you share with them in the funeral uh, or the wedding of their family members. Uh, their stories are no longer just those people over there. They're the person that you sat with, the person who welcomed you, the person who sh shared their tears or their joy with you. When you come back, then, the most I think one of the important things that the church can do is to help us make connections between the people that we met there and the people that live in our communities here and the issues that are facing our own people here in the United States. I've just been sent to now start a new church in downtown Long Beach. In Long Beach, we are the third highest city in the United States with a percentage of children living below the poverty line. Over 33% of the children in Long Beach live below the poverty line. My role, one of my roles, is to make a connection between U.S. policy globally, and in particular to Israel-Palestine, to the fact that 30% of my children in my new town live below poverty line. Because one of the reasons why Americans, I think, sometimes get disassociated from that particular conflict, they think, well, it's that thing that's way over there. We don't have anything to do with us. It doesn't touch my life, daily life. But it does touch our daily lives because the suffering that are in our own communities is often connected to the suffering in other communities because the same issues help to drive it, whether it's the militarism, they force them, they focus on violence, uh, the ways in which we solve conflict, our um, heightening of fears of the other, they're related dynamics. So one of the roles that we have as church people in our, is to make connections between our human family and our human sufferings because it's in making those connections to human suffering that then I can become, my heart is opened up in a way of compassion, uh, of listening, of solidarity, and then working together to make the changes that allow this new world, uh, that God vision that Jonathan spoke of, to actually come into being. Uh, and we have to place that before our peoples uh, in the pew, uh, to, to be out in the streets in our communities and making those connections. So it does shrink uh, uh, the world in a way that it's not just them and us, but it's, it's all of us together. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Uh, Don Wagner is Presbyterian. I've been very active in the divestment uh, issue and in 
study and teaching and learning about Christian Zionism. So, Don? I came to this issue of the injustices with the Palestinians and the struggle with Israel through the church. My background, however, is fundamentalist Christianity. I grew up a Christian Zionist. But then I became politicized in the late 60s and 70s. And I had to stretch to blend personal faith with social justice. And I think this is one of our major tasks. How do we maintain the commitment to our personal faith and embrace justice and take back issues like justice and poverty because the right wing has hijacked it? And I think we need to reclaim it. This is what Jim Wallace is talking about, which one of our Chicago guys, Barack Obama, is talking about. And I think it's time now to embrace the issues of justice and to be courageous and prophetic. This issue is being locked out of the mainstream. And the church has a special responsibility to raise the central issue of justice for Palestine and for the whole Middle East. I would also add that uh, we need to find ways to do that nonviolently. And I think that phase selective divestment is one of those tools. And if you take the choice of blending faith with politics and taking on justice on this issue, be prepared to be smeared be prepared to be challenged, and I think we have to be peaceful as we are challenged in those ways. And we have really been attacked as Presbyterians. Uh, many may think that the Presbyterians retreated at the General Assembly this year. Press releases were put out that said that before the vote was even taken. But let me assure you, we only removed the word divestment. The process of divestment is still there. And this is a response to our sisters and brothers in Christ in Palestine, but also our Jewish and Muslim neighbors who are asking for the church to do something, to take a stand, and this is one that we can. So I would urge other denominations and for you at the local level to study this as a possible way to go. And I think a lot of churches are preparing to do that. I think also I've been terribly concerned because perhaps of my background that this issue of Christian Zionism is a very difficult one. It is infiltrating the mainland churches. We need to be aware of it. I think we need to find ways of biblically and theologically educating our people and particularly our young people about this, I think, quite dangerous doctrine. Uh, there's a conference going on this weekend in San Antonio of a new Christian Zionist lobby that is going to be huge. Their plans are to have operations in every single state and lobby for a hardline, really hardline, right-wing Israeli and right-wing Christian perspective. We need to challenge that and find ways peacefully to offer an alternative. All right, I think Reverend Ard was right. I just want to affirm relationships at the local level are really crucial. And what you can do in dialogue with the Jewish community and the Muslim community around these issues are absolutely essential. Thank you. And finally, Fahed Abu Akko, Palestinian born, now living here, but we all know him, especially those of you in this room who are Presbyterians, as one of the moderators of the Presbyterian Church. I first met him when he was on a moderator's trail running around the country talking to Presbyterians and the Methodists like me. So please, as a native of uh, Palestine, you bring a particular perspective, and as a church leader, you can talk to us about what can the church do by it. Thank you. And for 10 seconds is not included in the five minutes. I claim the second or the third uh, chair, and I went to the West Room. I came back, and I became displaced. <laughs> First, I would like for uh, those who come in the uh, uh, church tradition, please get to know your church mission history in Israel and Palestine. Second, uh, pray for the church in Israel and Palestine. Imagine a hundred years ago, 
almost 30% of the population. Now, uh, I was generous in this uh, map and the information back, say so it's 33%. Uh, most of the church leaders say in Israel and Palestine, they are less than 2%. So every time you take a group, the church leaders say, will you please help us to stay on the land? And so to me, uh, we need to pray for the church uh, there. And uh, of course, we need to pray for Israel and the Jewish people and our Muslim sisters and brothers. Third, uh, sponsor a mission project, have a sister church, uh, have a scholarship for students in one of the colleges and universities in Palestine or in Israel. Uh, to me, uh, the best way to involve our people to have a sister church. With being a sister church, have three things. You, you pray for one another. Second, email one another. Three, hear the story of one another, what they do there, what we do here. And three of the things open, to go and see them in person. So it's something to me in our mission alley is an excellent way to connect uh, with the church there. I hope that uh, uh, out of this conference, you will start planning to think about visiting uh, Israel and Palestine, going to a Sabine uh, conference, or taking a mission trip. Let it be 50% just going through the land, because when you go through the land and come back and read the New Testament, the New Testament becomes a lot. But at the same time, uh, you know, 90% of the tourists, they go, they pray, they love Jesus and come back and don't know nothing what is going on. Connect with the church, connect with the uh, Israeli and the Muslim and the Christian and the Jewish and let those voices, let us be contextual now, that's to me, it's uh, uh, very powerful. So i like for us to visit there. To me, uh, uh, this is the, the first time, you know, Professor Helper, usually his lectures about one hour and a half, he did it with 45 minutes. I would say, that inviting Israeli Jews and American Jews to our churches at this point in history is the best thing we can do. Inviting to a Wednesday night, to a Sunday school, to a Sunday night. Let that voice be heard because they are not heard and they don't have venue. And unless you and I provide a venue for them, uh, that uh, clarity that I saw uh, this afternoon with the map and a prophetic voice, to me, he is like Micah in the 21st century, okay? So we need to focus on inviting Israeli Jews and American Jews to our churches. And I attended uh, my uh, Israeli uh, Jewish brother who is a soldier and spoke about his, his journey. Six, uh, please remember there's something in Washington called Churches for Middle East Peace. And I have a website in that piece. That means most of your churches are part of there. I don't think you know they exist. Okay, connect with them because they can give you an email up to date about anything that's going on in Washington and we can connect uh, with them. Uh, finally, uh, support the uh, Sabine ministry in Jerusalem and here. Uh, you know the, uh, Dick, he's an Episcopal priest and they are so rich they never ask for money. Uh, Presbyterians uh, need to help a little bit the uh, Episcopalian. Uh, I wish that uh, some of you would go to a Sunday school, to a mission committee, and say, let's put Sabine on our mission budget. Uh, don't think of 10,000, think about 200, 500, thousand, whatever the money that you want, support them, because unless we support them, the, the thing that I love about Sabine, say, here we are Christians, we are under occupation, and this man, Naim Atik, for the first time brought men, women, clergy, uh, uh, and young people, everybody, and say, this is our situation. How are we going to do theology in our context? So those people need our support, and I hope you put them on, on your budget. I'm finished. Thank you very much, Shia. Now, 
as I promised, I want to have the voice of the people heard. And I think you have been building up questions in your own mind as the day has gone on. You've got five people, very knowledgeable here, speak to them. So I'm going to see if I can see you through the floodlights. Stand up and give us a question. Oh, you're going to have to have a mic. All right. I have read that there's about $2 billion a year the U.S. supplies military aid to Israel. I presume that the total amount of aid is higher. So first I'm asking, what is the total amount of aid, not just the military? And what would happen if that were to be cut off completely because of, I know, don't laugh. <laughs> uh, if it were to be cut off completely because of a stated reason that it is inhumane what is happening there. Excellent question. I will use it to say, what action could the church take, once we've confirmed the information you've raised with us, to address that issue? All of you. Anyone who wants to speak to it. Um, I think the amount is more in the range of $6 billion a year. Jeff, do you have an amount? Four. $4 billion. Uh, Washington report has said six. A lot is hidden. Uh, 75% of it is military. Yeah, yeah. Frankly, I don't know right now that that is a starter, as Jeff said. Ulmer got how many ovations when he put up his apartheid plan? Um, I think, again, the divestment is an important tool here to raise the economic issues and link them to the violence that's being committed under the occupation. I mean, that is one thing that the church can do to move forward. The Presbyterian Church has, a, has uh, for the last 25 years, asked for uh, Israel to stop the occupation, stop the settlements, at late settlement construction to cut and aid at one point, and it went nowhere. So divestment was kind of a thing. Well, nothing else has worked. So we'll say, my pension dollars and whatever I invest, I will not benefit from the suffering of another people. So the church is acting in a sturdy way uh, on that small amount. So I think this is one thing we can do, and that's why I think this phase selective investment is a step. Others may say, you know, we have to go right after the, the aid cut. But I think right now in this political climate, that's a non-starter. Uh, others may disagree. All right. Uh, let me just put a little PS on that, Don. As you said, the Presbyterians dealt with this issue for many, many years, objecting to the occupation. Got a lot of attention this year. What was that for? Because of the word divestment. Now the word apartheid has been introduced in the discussion, not only by Jeff Alba, but by Jimmy Carter. Words are very important in this discussion. One of the things the churches can do is to say, let us not let other people tell us what we will call something. If it's divestment, it's divestment. If it's apartheid, that's the way we see it. So have something to say about the language that's being used in the public uh, discourse. All right, right here. Somebody needs to get her a microphone. And you may address the question generally, or you can focus on one of the panelists. I'm just curious, if we are saying that that's such a powerful word, where's the lobby coming from for the uh side of all the money that has gone for, for years to Israel that most of the uh, U.S. population knows nothing about. I mean, part of the I mean, lobby, the initial uh, large sums of money, of course, came out of uh, Camp David One. I mean, under Carter's administration. Uh, uh, and uh, initially, of course, also grew out of uh, initial Cold War issues. But when that, that Fell, fell away and became a part of the reality of our industrial military complex. In fact, that there's you know, almost no congressional district in the United States now that does not have some military sort of contract, which is one of the reasons why it becomes very difficult to go into your congressional leadership to talk to them about this issue, because it's, you're talking about people's jobs. 
Um, and uh, it becomes a, con a continuing way in which we have maintained a policy uh, across the Middle East. Uh, it was our foothold for a, for a while during the, the Cold War issue. It became the driving force for that. Uh, you had a lot of the issues not only from the Jewish lobby, but for, from the Christian right lobby. Uh, the largest single contributor to the Jewish National Fund at least three years ago was not a Jewish organization, but a Southern Baptist congregation. Uh, because of the uh, millennialist uh, Armageddon sort of thinking about this is the end times and Jesus coming back and all the Jews have to be gathered into the land before Jesus, you know, you can run out sort of the, the millennial kind of thinking, um, you get a lot of support since the Reagan administration, basically, from that period on that has driven a lot of that increased uh, uh, financial pieces to go. But there's a lot of different uh, forces at play uh, in that. You know, I, uh, I want to say that really from all the way from uh, Truman until now, Democrats and Republicans, we are committed to the state of Israel. Uh, so the, the, from the administration to the Congress to the military, everything is so, the metrics is so solid. So the church is just letting focus in the wilderness, but we need to speak. Uh, you know, a word of justice. And the thing that, you know, came to my mind, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, the home of Martin Luther King. The lieutenant of Martin Luther is John Lewis. Huh? And John Lewis is an African-American, and I looked at his income. He received $175,000 from the American Jewish community. So my American political system is so naked, it needs a dollar, it needs a vote. May God forgive the Palestinians in America. They don't have a dollar, and they don't have a vote. I mean, it's naked reality. So unless the church and the synagogue speaks a word of justice, they're going to stay in the ditch. I don't want to cut off these other two panelists. If anybody wants to just stick your hand out there and say, I'm ready to talk. All right, here we, we have a question right here. I go to the grocery store and I see uh, vegetables and fruit that's there from Israel, and I think about boycotting that. But I think about the fact that the churches don't talk about the jobs that are involved with all this military uh, production. And I'm one of those people that decided a long time ago that I was going to have vegetable contracts with local farmers and buy my meat from local people and my bread. And I never hear the church people talk about agriculture as an honest way to earn a living and that farmers need to be paid properly. I want to know if anyone thinks about the fact that 70% of our raw materials do wealth every year that comes from agriculture, but we've been paying half price of it. We've been strangling our national economy that's based upon unlimited solar energy that God gives us. So I want to know how we can tie the things together the honest kinds of jobs that people need to do to keep ourselves well fed and to promote our local economies and how that ties in with these jobs that nobody needs to have those bonds. All right. Okay. Does anybody need to address this? Okay, we'll move on to another question. What about? Is that your question? All right. Well, it's a huge question. I mean, I did lay it out because I think we think it's exactly the kind of connections that, that we in the church have to begin to help make. Um, and because when you're talking about uh, the investment, when you're talking about trying to uh, transform the military industrial complex that, that runs the economy uh, in, in our country now, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, it's not something that's going to have a, a simple fix. But the, the church has to begin to have those kind of conversations. We can't just talk about becoming peacemakers if we don't, and if we follow a, the Prince of Peace, if we have no intention of knowing what that looks like. I mean, we've been trying violence for a long time. It hasn't seemed to be real effective, so maybe we should try the other for once in a while. But we, we don't do that. We speak it, but we're not willing to look at the, the hard economic realities of how do you make those choices. So I don't have a, an easy solution to give you, but I think it has to become a primary conversation of the church to be effective um, and how we do economy and how we live with each other because they are connected to each other. So it just, it has to happen. We're just not doing it yet. Oh, 
All right, thank you. Now, we've not been able to get something in the far corners of the world. Yes, right over there against the wall. We will get uh, over there near the fence. We will let <laughs> I've been thinking about the comment of uh, go to our churches and have them take Seville on as a ministry of mission, whatever the word might be. If some of you could address just the best way to go about that, if there's to be a material or if we just speak on our own about it, who to approach, those kind of things. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. We find uh, that Seville has been able on um, requests to come from various parts of the country. We have a network that is developing uh, throughout the country and uh, these conferences we put together uh, have people that uh, either live close to a lot of places that we get the requests for. Uh, so we have a speakers kind of uh, bureau that's developing and uh, a request can be made to Seville and Portland and we can uh, look for a speaker in your own church or help you with a program. We do have a lot of written materials. Uh, we have things from Seville, Jerusalem, uh, study courses, uh, worship uh, uh, manuals on uh, Lenten study. And so we do have materials that people can ask for and receive. Well, if, if my church wants to be a supporter of Seville, Dick, what do I do? Do I come to your website and uh, write to you and then you tell us that we have items that need funding? How would you recommend that we go about that? The way we have it now with a number of churches that uh, we've got in the budget, they uh, have sent us a, a, a request form to fill out, and we have sent it back, and they send us something every uh, three uh, every three months. Uh, some do it once a month. We have some churches that give, take up a mission offering uh, and send it to us once a month or once a year. Uh, not many, but we do have some churches that are very dedicated and some ministries throughout the country. Uh, I was referring earlier to the fact that a lot of these churches want to have education material also because that, that connection is there. They want to know what they're giving to and they want to know something about what the issue is. What comes out of that eventually has, has been people going over. We've discovered that people have uh, found uh, through the material that we send and talk about, they come over uh, on our civil trips or FOR trips. A uh, number of very good, and we're uh, establishing a website right now to, uh, 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 that is going to be up and running soon on the different groups that are taking people over that we want you to visit our website and see where uh, what groups are, are happening in the next year that kind of thing but yes uh, contact us uh, send us a check <laughs> you'll be on our mailing uh, I will write you back and we can try to get a speaker to you uh, we, we would like to be in your budget uh, you know, Episcopalians uh, don't know how to ask for money. <laughs> uh, basically, this man has been after me for several months. He was at Atlanta area to raise some money. He needs to raise at least $100,000 for all the staff there to pay the rent. They just moved to Jerusalem from place to place. And that staff uh, needs support. And uh, so to me, you know, if, suppose we have uh, just, uh, you know, five, ten churches, twenty churches from this group. We'll say, I'm going to budget $500,000 a year, whatever it is the amount you want. Uh, we, they need money and we need to support it. And the more, you know, we support it, the good thing about Sabine, local and in uh, Jerusalem, they have an audit and they give you every dollar, income and expenses, so they are honest. As the word of the moderator. <laughs> all of your, all of our denominations, um, Christian denominations here, have various projects uh, that we help to support uh, that are being run by the Christian communities uh, as well as the Muslim and Jewish communities. I suspect depending on your denomination, of programs that are being run that are some of the most important for keeping hope alive. So go to your denominational uh, website, your mission pages, find out what those are, and find one that fits into an area uh, that your folks are engaged in. If it's children's ministry, if it's reconciliation work, if it's replanting olive trees. I mean, you know, Jeff and Salim went on a speaking tour in a Minnesota annual conference 
Uh, and out of that speaking tour, the next year, the annual conference at the United Methodist Church of Minnesota raised $50,000 to, re to rebuild the Shawarma's home for the fifth time. Um, because they got exposed to the story, and they, they, they saw it, they heard it, they respond, and they responded dynamically. It was a huge offering out of the annual conference for one, for one project. Um, so getting the stories and taking those mission stories of the various kinds of work that people are doing to your congregations will generate. And right now, people need that kind of monetary support from us because they cannot run them on their own because of the economic situation. So find ways to give, whether it is through Seville, or any of the other projects that your churches may already have established there. I, uh, you all must surely know Doug Dix, who is your Presbyterian representative in uh, Palestine. Uh, I was once moved to uh, make a small donation to Doug and the work he's doing, and I've been on the mailing list ever since. <laughs> That's why I, I know Fahed, Presbyterians know how to raise money. But of course, I have relied on Doug Diggs over the years. Whenever I go over there, I sit down and we have a long meeting. He's been extremely valuable to me. So just having missionaries like Sandra for nine and a half years for the Methodist, and also serving on the other denominations, or Doug Diggs for the Presbyterian, very, very valuable personnel. And we need, through our denomination, denominations to uh, reach and be of help to them. I get the signal, we have five minutes to go. Can we get another quick question? And you know, right here. Uh, all right, find, find a, a person who wants the mic. Yeah. All right. Since 2000, which is the date of the second intifada, we noticed that there's a huge migration from Christian Palestinians out of Palestine. Okay, and the problem with this migration is that the Christian Palestinians in general are the middle class, which means that the doctors, the engineers, the professors, okay, that create a huge vacuum within the Palestinian society. And not only that, you know, the, the, without them becomes a conflict between Muslims and Jews. I'm not Muslim myself, okay? But when, I, when, when, when we take the Christian Palestinians out of the equation, it becomes a conflict between Muslims and Jews, and that becomes, you know, terrible for, for the current situation in Palestine. So what would the church, the role of the church, in supporting particular Christian Palestinians inside Palestine and to stop this migration problem? Thank you for raising that. Um, the situation, I think, is even more severe than what Fahad said. Uh, some of the leaders are saying that the population of Christians in the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem, has dropped under 1.5%. If you think even in 67, the ratio was 13%. If you look at that trajectory, there's going to be nothing left in a generation. So it's a crisis, and the silence of the church in the West is deafening. We need to make this an issue in the churches. We need the Muslim community to partner with us in making this an issue. And why are people leaving? The right-wing Christians and some of the Jewish establishment organizations say they're leaving because of militant Islam. That's a cover. It's a lie. They're leaving because of the occupation. There's an economic war going on now. And the occupation and everything that Jeff so showed you so eloquently is why people are leaving. So we need to address the justice issues we're at, which are at the heart of it. So we need to go to the heart of what the problem is and address that as churches and raise the question of, of, of the Christians, but not in a sectarian way. We need to be careful not to only care about Christians. And that's why to link it to the justice questions is absolutely essential. Uh, and I, I think finally we need to uh, be aware that the right-wing Christian Zionists are one of our biggest problems in this. They have absolutely no concern about the local Christians. And in fact, the face of Christianity is going to become uh, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and Reverend Hagee uh, in the Middle East. So we need to really challenge that side of it, too. The heads of the Christian churches uh, in the spring sent uh, a letter out asking for three things from the Christian communities for the Christian community to help keep them there to, for the, the issue that they raised. 
One was that we would help in the establishment of housing uh, for, for young Palestinian Christian families. Two is job creation issues and, and real economic development, but it, it's a struggle to do real economic development in a, in a strangulation. You don't do anything that's real economic because you can't move anything. You can't move goods, you can't move people. So that the whole idea of how do you do a, a viable economy in the situation becomes an impossible situation. So you're not just creating some kind of a, a sort of welfare system where you just keep giving money to have people do sit around and look like they're doing something. But those are two of the things that they have asked for. You point out something that's very important, though, that it really is a, a bit of a class issue, because if you look at the numbers of Palestinians who are leaving now, um, particularly in the Bethlehem area, the numbers of families, whether they're Muslim or Christian families, are actually about the same percentage. Um, you don't notice it as much in the, the Muslim community because the percentage is so much greater that the, it doesn't shrink the population so fast. But again, it, there is also the middle class Folks, the folks that sort of the, the professors that le level, the doctors and so on that you talked about, across the community that are the ones that have the access and the ability to leave. Um, and that what you're leaving, what we're leaving with behind is the folks who are already living <laughs> in poverty and those who have a little bit left to get out because they're not going to subject their family to it. So while we have to do those things of trying to help pe people there, we have to also deal with the justice issue at the same time, because you don't change the situation by just helping to create jobs uh, that keep people maybe on the ground for time. You've got to deal with the overarching issue at the, at the same time. All right, I think we have a list in a minute. I'm gonna ask our pastor host if he would uh, sort of put a wrap up on uh, this. It didn't give him much time, so here it is. <laughs> you know, we, we um, we do have the language of justice, um, and and that is language that that we have to continue to articulate and to imagine. Um, uh, justice is as much a work of imagination um, as anything else, and, and we have to continue to do that. But we also have to recognize not only the demand and call of justice, but also the limit. Um, uh, justice is limited in this sense. We must demand justice in the sense that that everybody involved is dehumanized, including those of us who speak from safe, secure places and, and do not recognize the spiritual peril that we are in, but only uh, brothers and sisters and children of God are rejected. But we need to recognize when we speak of justice, we are not able to speak of things being made right that have been wrong. There, there is far too much that cannot be made right, uh, that, that cannot be, um, be made, uh, made right. It, it can be redeemed, and it can be redeemed through reconciliation. It can, re it can be redeemed by the restoration of recognizing humanity and, and holding that up. And, and so not only does, does the, the call of the church and the role of the church to be a voice for justice, we have to be a voice for reconciliation um, and redemption because we have to acknowledge um, that which cannot be made right and to suggest that it can de uh, devalues the death of pain and sacrifice and injury that so many have endured for far, far too long. Thank you. It seems only appropriate that we end today with a prayer. And I'm very pleased to ask Mamed Ayan. I heard him give the call of the night prayer last October at Iftar. And um, join us, please, in the call to prayer. Those of you that have been to the Holy Land, it will bring tears to your eyes and it always goes to mind. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. 
اشهد ان محمد الرسول الله اشهد ان محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح